Okay, fire away. <laughs> John, in the preface to your 78 book, you start out one point saying, I don't believe in Sasquatch, this isn't a book for believers. It's a book about an investigation that's not yet complete. Where do you think the investigation stands now, and what would you like to see bring it to completion if it's not? Well, actually, that's a very timely question because I think DNA evidence may finish this whole thing in a matter of weeks, months. We're getting very, very close. And, uh, that's the way I see it. Now, I know I've gone for 30 years, I guess, figuring I probably would never live to see the end of this. And of course, most of the people I was with have not lived to see it. But I think that we no longer need a body and the DNA will establish the existence of a separate species for very long. John, I was wondering if you could talk about the Albert Osman uh, interview and it must have been incredulous for you at the time, at the beginning really, of your research to meet someone with one of the most incredible Sasquatch stories ever told, probably the most incredible story ever told. And when, after getting all the details, you really started to realize that you were believing this man was telling the, you the truth. Well, uh, I don't remember when I just first heard of or, or read the story, but I do know that both men at the end and myself didn't pay any attention to it. I don't know why we are. <laughs> Carry on. And uh, then what happened is that an experienced radio news reporter came up to this area to, to see me because he was in considerable confusion. As he put it, if he had interviewed Osman, if Osman wasn't telling the truth, he didn't know if he had ever interviewed anyone who was. It was just about his exact word. So then we went and talked to Osman. And uh, he proved to be a delightful personality. And, uh, you know, there's nothing obviously in indicating that he would be a storyteller other than the nature of his story. And I took the local magistrate who had been a uh, defense counsel before he retired to Aristotle, uh, who cross-examined him in a way that left me feeling very awkward and embarrassed that I had subjected this loss to it. But it didn't, it didn't phase him a bit. He told his story. And on a later occasion, I took Dara Swindler, the, the author of the Atlas of Comparative Anatomy of an Ape and Human, and uh, also the veterinarian from the Federal Primate Center at the University of Washington, who, who was also the uh, veterinarian for the big apes at the Seattle Zoo. And these two experts questioned us from half an afternoon. And then we went for coffee afterwards. They said, well, if he didn't have this experience, he must have had a period in his life when he really had an opportunity to observe great age because he had never said anything. It didn't make sense. And, uh, so that's one side of the picture. The other side is that nobody, including myself, has been able to relate the actual geography where he said he went into the bush to the location where he went out of it. And the story would require this creature to have carried him up, up and down over several mountain ranges in the course of part of the night. So, you know. Oh, and the other, the other significant thing is that Hossman 
wasn't alone in this, but he was going totally against the uh, common understanding of Sasquatch, which was well known in this area, and uh, was supposed to be a giant Indian with long hair, where he's you know, describing something totally different. And uh, there's just so much detail in what he says. I can't go very far into it, but I don't know, and I don't think we will ever know, but that he was able to uh, construct a, a detailed picture that through the years, either that's what these things are, or everybody since has been copying us. Yeah. yeah, there's uh, been a lot of uh, discrepancies in regards to uh, reports for his story, um, basically on his opportunity for escape. Did he elaborate on that with you, and can you elaborate on that with us? I didn't catch all of that. Um, there's been different, different, different reports of what happened and how he was able to escape. I'm just wondering if he told you the actual story of how he escaped, so that... Oh, he, his entire story was written. Uh, another man... You have to realize that at this time there was a big fuss going on about Sasquatch. And there were so many stories that the two daily newspapers in Vancouver were each listing Sasquatch on their front page index. And, and one of these people that had, had ended his story by saying he didn't know what these were. And Osman got in touch with this man and said he knew what they were. So then this man arranged for the newspaper somebody to come and interview Osman and they told him that this person was coming. So Osman sat down and tried to reconstruct everything he could remember and, and wrote it all out in a book. So uh, that's where the, the story you read comes from. Well, when they, we got word that, uh, I actually forget how that happened even. Oh, you know, I came I heard from the British Columbia Museum who uh, Roger had contacted because he wanted them to have some tracking dogs bought down. And uh, I forgot now how arrangements were made, but anyway, I knew that the film had been sent to Roger Patterson's brother in law. And uh, what went to his house on the day when we knew about that Roger was returning. <laughs> the brother-in-law already had the film and had been showing it and she projected it and scratched it and so on. And uh, he didn't show it to, to us. Uh, see, Jim McLaren was there as well, I know. And Renee, of course, and myself. But uh, he waited until Roger showed up and then showed it to Roger, who, of course, didn't know what he had on his film at that point. And then we were invited to come down and see it, <coughs> showing it in the downstairs room. And uh, actually, uh, it was quite surprising to me, because the first time I saw the footprint sinking this deep into hard sand, it was a shock. Good Lord, there's something happening here. There is something to this. But when I saw the movie, I had no reaction at all. I just, oh yeah, there, there is one. You got a picture of one. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, we were, oh, and we expected, uh, we knew we had some, said, had some footprint cast. And Renee and I had just been down in California six weeks before and come back with casts for the what we call the 15-inch print and the 13-inch print. 
we naturally expected that what he would show us would be, you know, which ones are going to be. And uh, my friend, Dr. Melbourne, notwithstanding, it wasn't either of them. It was a, a print we'd never seen, and we'd seen a lot of prints of the 15. On that one occasion, a great many prints of the 13 also. And then uh, afterwards, when we were discussing this, there was this little yellow Kodak box, I think you probably all remember. There was, it was just sitting there on the table. And Rene had one with, with some of his film in it, and I wondered if that's why he didn't just switch. Juan, who was running his wife at the time, was probably laughing at that part. <laughs> I never met William Rowe because he moved away very shortly after. But when I was mis mistakenly had the idea that sworn statements would help in getting scientists to pay some attention to this, uh, I wrote to him. And uh, he went to the trouble of going to an official in, in Edmonton and uh, having his story sworn to. And he also had his daughter draw the picture that I think most of you must have seen in the book somewhere, sent that to me. Uh, but I never met him, never spoke to him. Uh, I did, on a later occasion when I was traveling across Canada selling my books, uh, I encountered in two different cities, two different scientists that I went to see who said that they had regularly corresponded with William Rowe about Buffalo and that he was an excellent observer of wildlife. Ivan was writing a book about North American ecology and traveling around the United States and somebody sent him a clipping of a magazine article based on what I'd been doing. As a result of which he took a side trip to Willow Creek to talk about the Bigfoot friends. And then he came up to see me at my home. And uh, that's the only time I was ever with him, but I took him to see Osman and, and uh, to see the chaplains from the Ruby Creek site. Uh, 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 he was involved in us getting together with Tom Slick. We, we had the idea that his Slick was financing uh, uh, research in the Himalayas into the bottom of the snow and maybe you would finance us. And we knew that Sanderson knew it, so uh, this is all very blurred now, it's 50 years ago. Uh, Sanderson was, was greatly involved. Well, I think he was officially the scientific part of, of the, what was called at Slick's insistence, the Pacific Northwest Expedition. And it wasn't in the Pacific Northwest, and it was an expedition where other people were picking berries. But anyway, that's what. It, it has a fame now out of all the portion of it. Was ever, they were actually men. And then after Slick brought Peter Byrne over, that was the end of that. The real research went on from then on. Uh, they <laughs> <laughs> One of the many wonderful things I find in your book, from a science perspective, was the structured interviews you did and accumulated the database where not just a bunch of stories, but consistency of characteristics that you queried about. How did you decide to do that? Did you come up with that on your own or suggest it to you? It just seemed the natural thing to do when you're trying to learn about something. I think it's a monumental contribution where you, I think one of the chapters you have which you call, I think it's titled, What is a Sasquatch? Where you go through sort of the cross-classification. Just a wonderful piece of science writing. Yeah, I, I used to uh, put things on uh, file cards in the beginning. Not right in the beginning. The beginning was totally unstructured. <laughs> Gradually. Just make a file card for each instant and then do a and saving in a loosely 
minor any detail that I had. Then I started putting things on maps. The markers on the map were just pins they had number size, time of day, all the stuff you could get. If you had the key to it, you could read off the map. And then when the computer age came in, actually before it was really in, they had uh, outfit called American National Enterprises wanted to get a Sasquatch movie of their own. I think they've been negotiating with Roger, the Mike's price, and uh, wanted to do a computer survey, so I, I handled that for them, got a lot of other people involved. So then we had the stuff in the computer. And after we had several hundred reports, you know, down on punch cards, I don't know what happened after that. I do know that when we went to the University of BC, where they recording this on the mainframe. Main uh, somebody had to run down the, the basement and get a big tape and put it up somewhere on the computer. Uh, and it only took us an hour or two to realize that we didn't have enough information to really use anybody. Just, um, it'd be a, a couple of hundred questions on, on, on the form of 10 answers. And, uh, abandoned road and I went around the right angle corner and came up upon a log about this thing right across the road. And it was the middle of the night and I had an old uh, part of a logger stop over this log in my car. And I had to get up there in the dark. Woods, woods behind me where all the Sasquatches were and saw <laughs> Yeah. The other thing is, see, I couldn't go back, it was too steep. I had to go up, get down and turn around. Right. You got involved in this um, before you met Gimlin and Renee. What was your opinion of Bigfoot? Well, I grew up with the Sasquatch, you know, and it was supposed to be a giant Indians with long head hair. And they had fires and they had villages. Uh, and then we started, and, and by the way, the, the Indians are not to blame for this because when, when they had a big Sasquatch Day celebration here back in the 1940s, the Indians contributed to Sasquatch and it was totally covered with fur and didn't have long hair. So they knew what they were talking about. But the, you know, the overall community did. Well, I didn't have any idea personally until I talked to some witnesses, and they, they described something much more like Nate than a human. Then uh, after I saw the footprints in the hard sand, that was obviously something that that weighed many times what a human weighs. And I, I, I could make a complete footprint, just the heel was outlined completely. We didn't have tread on our boots in those days. All, all of the sole was was just a, a flattened area with no edges. And I was beside these tracks that you have seen some here that sink in like that. And that's, you know, that's what really settled things. I've been trying to find out ever since what makes those tracks. Uh, you know, nobody to this day has uh, <coughs> produced any way that humans can do it. You know, the big alternative in this whole subject is, is it an animal or it, uh, is it a, a human activity that's involved? Human activity won't explain anything unless you have a look at it. 
Yeah. Debate with yourself very much about becoming the public person who's going to stand up and say, hey, there's something out here? Or did you, you know, really consider that a lot? Or did you just do it? Yeah, I've been involved in that. I'm a big headed. <laughs> do you think you paid a price for that? Do you think you paid a price? No, for I bet a ball. Maybe the luckiest thing that ever happened to, to me is that when I first went down to California, saw footprints my wife was with. Thank you, John. 